some fright fans to the horror story corner. Aware tonight, we have a short but sweet terror tale penned by Oliver Onions. It centers around a proud poltergeist by the name of Sir Egbert the Dauntless. Dauntless as he no doubt is, he shouldn't go too far. Or he may find himself exiled to the horrible and terrifying daylit regions of the human world. I hope you enjoy the mortal. Oh, Egbert, the white lady implored, let me beg of you to abandon this mad, wicked idea. Sir Egbert the Dauntless was in the act of passing himself through the wainscot of the North Gallery. He turned, half on this side of the panel, half already in the priest's hole in the thickness of the wall. No, Rowena, he replied firmly. You saw fit to cast doubts upon my courage before all the family ancestors, and now I intend to do it. If anything happens to me, my essence will be upon your head. The Lady Rowena wailed. In her agitation, she clasped her hands awry, so that they interpenetrated. Nay, Egbert, I did but jest. On earth you were known as the Dauntless. Our descendants are proud of you. Cannot you forget my foolish words? No replied Sir Egbert sternly. Though it costs me my non-existence, I will spend the night in a human chamber. Egbert, Egbert, stay. Not that one, not the Parsons. Think, should he exercise you? Too late! I have spoken, said Sir Egbert, with an abrupt wave of his hand. He vanished into the fifth dimension. No sooner had he done so, Then the general lamentation broke out. Oh, he'll be, he'll be, I know he'll be, the white lady sobbed. To be reconfined in matter, so that there is no speech save with the tongue and no motion save with limbs. To be once more subject to the three dimensions of the grosser life is the final menace to the spectral condition. Poor chap. I fancied I detected a trace of visibility about him already, grim Sir Hugo muttered. Oh, it's playing with flesh, another cried with a shiver. Almost human folly. Already his guide isn't what it was, said the melancholy Lady Annis, who on earth had been a famous attender at funerals. I shall never behold his dear aura again, moaned the White Lady already half opaque herself. It will be the existence of me. If only it had not been a parson's chamber, said the Lady Anise, with mournful relish. Here, catch her quick. She's solidifying. Half a dozen of them cried at once. It was with difficulty that they brought the White Lady even to a state of semi-evaporation again. It was midnight, and the parson snored. He turned uneasily in his sleep. Perhaps already he was conscious of Sir Egbert's presence. Sir Egbert himself dared approach no nearer to the mortal bed than the lattice. Fear had given him the pink gossamer look that is the perilous symptom of veins and blood, and he knew that he received faintly the criss-cross shadow of the lattice. To save his non-entity, he could not have glided up the shaft of moonlight that streamed in the window. Suddenly, a violent, Hertzian wave passed through Sir Egbert's ether. He jumped almost clear out of his dimension. The parson had opened his eyes. To be or not to be, had he seen him? He had. His horrible, embodied eyes were on the poor, harmless spectre. The two looked at one another, the one quailing in the moonlight, the other sitting in all the horror of solidity, bolt upright in bed. 
Then the mortal began to practice his fearsome devices. First he gave the hoarse cry that all ghosts dread, and Sir Egbert felt himself suddenly heavier by a pound. But he remembered his name, the Dauntless. He would not yield. Then the parson's teeth began to chatter. He gibbered, and Sir Egbert wondered whether this was the beginning of the exorcism. If it was, he would never see the happy old ancestral gallery again, never hold his dear Rowena in perfect interpermeation again, never pass himself through a solid again, never know again the jolly old lark of being nowhere and everywhere at once. Mercy, mercy, he tried to cry, and indeed his voice all but stirred the palpable air, but there was no mercy in that grisly parson. His only reply was to shoot the hair up on his head, straight on end. Then he protruded his eyes, then he grinned, and then he began to talk, as it were, the deaf and dumb alphabet on his fingers. Sir Egbert's semi-substance was like reddish ground glass. It was the beginning of the agony. How near to the mortal precipitation he was, he knew when suddenly he found himself thinking, almost with fright, of his own dear white lady. She was a ghost. Then the mortal began to gabble words. It was the exorcism. Oh, why, why, why had Sir Egbert not chosen a layman? The gabbling continued. Colour, warmth, weight. These settled down on Sir Egbert, the dauntless. He half was. And as he continued steadily to become, the words increased in speed. Sir Egbert's feet felt the floor. He cried. A faint, windy moan came. The parson bounded a foot up on the bed, and tossed his pillow into the air. Could nothing save Sir Egbert? Ah, yes! They that lead a meek and blameless non-existence shall not be cast down. They shall not be given over at last to the terrors of the solid and known. From somewhere outside in the moonlight there came a shrill sound. It was the crowing of a cock. The parson had the pillow over his face. It fell and he looked again. Nothing was there. Sir Egbert, back in his comfortable fourth dimension, was of the loved, indivisible texture of his dear white lady again. Well, looks like a narrow escape for Sir Egbert. And for now he can remain without corporeality, along with his darling dead lover here in the moonlight of the horror story corner. Until next time, fried friends, and as ever, sleep well.